Well, to know you're still there and watching Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And right now it's time to look at the headlines that made it to the front pages of our dailies this morning. And uh, we're glad to also have uh, with us the person that will be x-raying uh, some of these uh, uh, headlines. It's Mr. Chris Kinde. Chris, good morning and welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Good morning to you. Okay, um, we're beginning with the nation, uh, the, the Punch newspaper, rather. Punch newspaper this morning is our first port of call. And um, we're just trying to figure out what we are supposed to get from there. Okay, the leading headline there is that 2024 federal government plans 26 trillion Naira budget debt servicing to gulp 8.25 trillion naira uh, that is uh, from the point newspaper leading headline i'd like you to begin with the comments on that yes um good enough um the budget is obvious that the federal government is almost ready for the budget so that means that uh, once the budget is uh, uh, ready they have to send it to the national assembly uh, for them for them to pass it. Uh, that means that probably we see a budget that is passed before the end of the year, for the 31st of December um, 2023. And so that the budget cycle can start from January. That is what it ought to be. Unlike what we had in the past, uh, we are trying to just see our budget cycle starting in March, or June, so April. Uh, so, yeah, it's that late, but um, the last government tried its possible way to revert to the January to December budget. We don't know. And secondly, this is going to be the highest budget we've had since the history of Nigeria since uh, uh, this is we made it pendant. So, but no surprising. Uh, but when you look at that budget, you can see that debt service is going to go up about 8.25 trillion. Yeah, that should be a source of concern to anyone. And that is part of uh, what we've been saying. Um, we continue paying debt at a point where we're almost using our uh, over 90, uh, about 90 percent of our revenue to service debt. So if it has, it is going to be at about 8.25 trillion. Then you can imagine what is there for capital projects. Uh, and it's true. the third one is the fact that most often than I personally don't believe in our so-called budget because implementation has always been the problem. You see us. At the end of the budget cycle, you try to look at the uh, the performance of the budget. You can barely across our board. You can barely see if the ministries, uh, MDAs, MDGs, um, uh, budget performance exceeding more than forty percent. Mm. And you ask yourself, what is that for? So I hope that this will going to be a, a, a going to be different, and we are going to be a budget that will be people oriented. Uh, I've not been able to look at the bank necessarily, but I think we should just be dealing more of capital projects than a recurring project, a recurring, because um, what we are having now is a, a structural deficit um, across the world, across the country. And you look at our infrastructure, including even roads. Um, I'll tell my brother, I'm sure you fly, the, uh, I'm sure one of the, the, the headlines may go capture it. You are in Lagos and you apply the third main land bridge. The third main land bridge is a dead trap now. You cannot speed on that uh, on that bridge, especially if you are heading from the Oshuki end to the island and uh, pothole, heavy pothole, and that. The best thing in the industry which we are going to place is just, um, uh, just uh, accident road. So those are part of the problem we are having. And uh, so I heard some of these projects going to take care of it. And um, lastly, it's also we are going to Ushu. We have to cut down on um, our allocation to uh, to security. Um, the, we are in a situation where we have practically 40% or 30% of our budgets going to the, the security. Our security architecture is not good for us. If the government tells us that um, insecurity is no longer as bad as it was in 2015 and thereafter, then why are we spending so much in security. Yes, I know that the country has to be secure, but it is not as bad as it was before. So, and we see billions and billions of naira being come to the military and to the army. 
and uh, at the end of it all, nothing's too much to show for it. So, um, I believe that that is where uh, the way to go. If we are going to pop the money into security, to go to the Nigerian police and not the Nigerian, and let's de depend less on the military because the military is supposed to just depend on their I guess external education. The primary responsibility of securing our internal security is police, and I believe that if they are well funded, and they will be able to do the job. Mm. I, don't, I don't know how many people will agree that the funding to security or for security should be cut, uh, but your, your, your reasons are quite strong. Uh, well, we have a, a situation where only 38% of the budget for 2024 will be used for maybe capital expenditure, uh, but we have personnel and uh, debt servicing uh, costing us 62% of that budget, that very, very big budget. And like you said, it's worrisome. But now, uh, even after all the talk about trying not to take loans uh, by this government, we have seen here that uh, um, the federal government gets over $1.5 billion, that's the headline, a fresh World Bank AFDB loan, December. That is according to the Minister of Finance. Okay, so we're expecting to get $1.5 billion loan from the World Bank and AFDB. Your comments, please. Um, although it has come down in history that in Nigeria's history, the last government uh, was the highest borrower of um, funds, as it were, if I use that word. Um, for international agencies and foreign countries. But at the rate at which government is even going away, that is just barely less than about three months into in this government, and the rate at which they are borrowing, then we may, the various administration may just be a child play. And the president told us that this, he specifically told us that this is not the way to go, that we are going to cut down on our borrowers. But the fact is that, still ask yourself, even if they don't, if they don't borrow, then how do we be able to run? Um, the budget as it were. Uh, but you, know, you have to understand, my brother, that he who goes and borrow, he goes and sorry. Definitely, we continue to borrow and borrow. Most of these debts will not be paid by, be paid by this, uh, this government. Uh, it has to be paid, some be paid back in 20, uh, 20 years' time, 10 years' time, 15 years' time. There is no problem in borrowing, and I've said that time and time again. Other countries of the world, including the United States, borrow. But the difference between what they do and what we do here. And they invest in uh, uh, issues. They, they invest in infrastructure. They invest in projects that that will service the people. That will be able to create employment. That will be able to uh, have a return on investment. So they invest those things on key infrastructure. But here, rather than doing that, what we borrow? We borrow money to pay salary. Borrow money to uh, for government officials to travel with their family and the rest of them. So at the end of it all, you just see that whatever we borrow as a loan from this uh, uh, international organization is not utilized effective and that becomes a problem. So I would think that the government should think, uh, think uh, well, um, the economic team should have, a, they should have a think tank that can be able to look at ways of raising more revenue, which will be able to diversify the economy and stop the, being a, a, a mono-dependent, export-dependent country that depends on only oil. If we can develop other sectors of the economy and be able to expand, uh, export more, then that will solve the problem. Thirdly, is the fact that also the refinery we've been talking about, most of our money that we earn, foreign exchange we earn, we use it to also import petroleum products. If our refineries are working there, there will be no need for us to do that. So that is part of the issue as it were. Then the, we have to look at the Naira. The Naira, as of today, is over between 100 and 1,030 to about 1,014 naira. That is unacceptable. Okay, well, uh, you just talked about the, the naira there, and one of the headlines there is subsidy removal. Naira fall pushes food inflation to 30 point something uh, percent. Uh, I don't know how we are going to survive this year and next year. It's going to be a problem. Um, and the most annoying part is that why the, uh, those in government say we should tighten our belt? They are losing gears. Mm. We should tighten our belt, uh, brace for, uh, for uh, some of the uh, shocks, as it were, and we should place some level of shock as well. 
you see your legislators at the National Assembly buying 130 million Naira SUV for themselves. Meanwhile, the minimum wage of 30,000 Naira, most of the states cannot pay. We are begging, the, 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 the workers are begging for increment in salary. Nobody is hearing that. The palliative that the government promised uh, that they're going to uh, get to the poor in Nigeria is not getting. And you can see, I'm sure you must have seen one of the parallel making the rant. We are a community leader in the state brought out a, 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 10, a, a 10 kg bag of rice that was given to him to share to a community of over 1,000. He was asking how he could be able to do that. So there's no sincerity of purpose on the part of government. If the government is sincere uh, and be able to create the enabling environment and make life meaningful for Nigerians, then all well and good. Nigerians are not, compared to other parts of the world, Nigerians are the most, most patient uh, people in the world. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> we do apologize. We know some of us uh, that are lovers of but we, are, we always equate that Nigerians are like Arsenal fans. Very, very patient. Uh, they see them year in, year out, um, 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 supporting their club. The fact that the club has not won the EPF over 14 or 15 years. So that is Nigeria. If Nigeria has the basic necessities, food, road, education, food, uh, light, good health. That's all. They don't ask for too much. But our government will never, our leaders will never do that. Rather, the rich want to get rich out so that the poor can get poor. But what they have to understand is the basic saying that the rich cannot sleep because the poor are awake. Once they are awake, then sleep becomes a problem for them. Mm. Well, they have, been, they have been talking in the Senate now. It got to the point where they have to say in the Senate and beg that they should let the poor breathe. <laughs> I will never forget that. Let the poor breathe. And the gavel went down for the senators to let the poor breathe. Uh, maybe I understood it differently, but it was, it was a terrible thing to have happened. But you just talked about palliatives. And I don't know, um, you, have, you have said everything. The insincerity of government is also uh, making a, a lot of people doubt whether they should trust the government or not trust the government and so some, some things may not even work. Palliatives, we understand that in the budget of 2023 from January to June, uh, the budget was 3 point something billion, uh, 3.26 or so billion uh, naira for su fuel subsidy. And then they now made a budget of about 3.17 or so uh, tri uh, billion to also do palliatives for three months. So the amount of money that was for fuel subsidy for six months is almost the same amount that they're going to use for palliatives for three months. And we're wondering how we're being hoodwinked by this or there's something we do not understand. Right now, one of the um, headlines on still the same punch is palliatives. Nigerians condemn poor ration lambast governors. Will this palliative even have any effect at all? I know you have talked about it, but what really do you think about this whole palliative thing? It's a total scam. It is a total scam. We've said it on time again. It's a total scam. It's just a, an avenue for uh, uh, money for the price. We are even talking about palliative. Wait and see when the, uh, the environment fund that they are talking about to be less privileged or whatever they call the vulnerable Nigerians. Just like the uh, Muhammad the Paris government did. I don't know why this government is going through this struggle. This money is money that can be channeled into positive uh, engagement for Nigerians. If you even build up uh, some companies or whatever, it's a short time, a long time, and make Nigerians employed, then that will help. But a situation where you want to go through the route of also sharing money to what 15 million Nigerians in a country that does not have a basic data that can be able to determine who, have you ever, let me ask you, my brother, have you ever seen, have you ever seen anybody that said that he has got any of this so-called money issued by government? Right from the time of um, uh, COVID, uh, the minister then, Minister of uh, Material Affairs, told us that she was feeding our children during COVID, the children, our children that were at home. And you ask yourself, and trillions and trillions of naira that to pay. Now, this government is going through that same route and deceiving themselves that they are going to. That, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, that is what it is. That is the government. Uh, but uh, forgetting that, 
what is the definition of government? Government, and <laughs> government is you and I. It's not those that sit in Abuja that are government supposed to be the citizens because we are the employers of labor. We are the ones that employ them. Everybody, including the president, is an employee of the Nigerian people. And it is for us to be able to determine what that we get. But what are we getting? We are getting the short side of the stick, the short end of the stick. So all the so-called uh, palliatives is a scam. Uh, most of the money that are given to the state government, they cornered it. Except for probably a state like Bono State. That is the only state I personally say that has made any meaningful. As bad as the situation is Bono State, that governor of Bono State is doing a wonderful job. You can see what he has done. With, even without the government assistance, you see what he has done. He has channeled most of the money into buying vehicles, into providing um, services, into providing food for um, his people. Those are things. All the one that the government promised, so-called thousands and thousands of um, vehicles that they promised, till now, nothing has happened. They were given one month of duration by the NLC after the last uh, 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 strike was pushed. And that uh, NLC said that is giving the federal government one month to be able to implement all the policies that agree with it. We're almost on the third, the third month, the third, third week now, and practically nothing has happened. So after one month, what happened? NLC said that you go on strike without anyone into the government, I don't even take any serious. Because they also are just also playing politics with Nigeria. But the fact is that anywhere that I say that this palliative is working, it's just totally talking about it. I just believe that the government is just sharing money. The money that is not available, right? they're just sharing it and giving certain individuals, and it's just going to the pocket of it. It should be just the same, and we find a more fundamental way, a uh, proper way of making sure that this money is properly utilized. You said oh, you remove subsidies. The peso so amount, just as rightly said, peso so amount of so, um, uh, that removal, this is what you recover from um, subsidy removal. Then on the other side, you are, want, you are also sharing palliative because of the effect of the removal of subsidy. And it, it, it goes to the same amount, if not more, than whatever you said you are recovered. So that, what, what sense does that make? What sense does that make? Why don't you leave <laughs> the subsidy so that, and you look at it, the so called. Um, uh, you are talking about how many people will it get to? But petroleum affects the life of every Nigerian. There's no single Nigerian, whether in the village or in town, that is not affected by the price hike in petroleum. So, so if you if you put on, I believe that you can yes, subsidies should, um, on petroleum should be removed. Well, I agree to some extent. But what have you put in place to be able to make sure that the people that you are removing the petrol subsidy you are removing? Is whatever measure you are bringing in place to be able to replace that? We don't have no free refinery is working. We are talking of Dangote petroleum. So now nothing has happened, and we still go back to what we and it becomes a problem. And the, the government have told us the market forces is going to determine the prices of um, petroleum uh, products. But here and I know that the prices have been going up in the international market due to the war in uh, uh, the war in uh, Ukraine and Russia, and now the Israeli Hamas war. The petroleum, the, the prices of crude is one, which automatically means that the price of importing petroleum products is also getting high. So why is it that <laughs> they've not increased the price also? You can see that this is just an economic somersault on the part of the Let's go to the nation newspaper. Some of the um, headlines are also on the punch newspaper, but let's take them from uh, the nation, how it's written there. Um, a very sad incident uh, w where they wrote that um, some pensioners, two Oshun pensioners slump during verification in Osh Oshobo. Uh, another story carried, or another newspaper carried, that 20 of them suffer from uh, uh, exhaustion uh, because of this verification. I don't know, with an, in an age of technology, why these people are still subjected to these. Uh, let me hear your own opinion about how these things are being done. Whether it's from the young people, NYSC, how they have to come, like 5,000 of them, to one small office just to sign their signature, or to the verification exercise that people have to be brought from their sick beds and all that. Can't it be done differently? Yes. Uh, where there's will, there's hope, and there's uh, a way. Uh, but the way we do this uh, in our country is different. In this year of technology, uh, of technology verification um, 
uh, doesn't have to go through that. But the fact is that there is corruption within the system, and those within the pension uh, board or whatever you call them have a systematic, uh, systematic way of siphoning money and putting fictitious names in the register just to be able to see. You saw what happened during the time of uh, now Jade uh, Mena. I remember Mena very well. Mm. That chairman, um, that pension fund, the uh, pension or whatever uh, committee. The person that was asked to go and verify the lapses within the pension now went to even dip his hand more into the piece and stole billions and billions of naira with his son. I think his son is still on the run, but he's in jail now. Now, so that is what I bet I, with technology, we know, we know that we can do this better. And at times, when you look at the situation and you see people without any, without supporting corruption, but you see that some of these things is what uh, some of the civil servants uh, think back and some of them just feel that, well, let me have my own share of the cake now rather than wait for, uh, for my retirement where I don't even know whether I'm going to get my pension. I have some of these pensioners, some of them are as old as 80, some are 75, and rest of them. I call them every year to come and do verification. I keep them in the sun for hours. Is that no more dignifying way of going about this verification without putting them through this? Can they be, can they provide a good um, place for them to sit down and even provide them with uh, basic uh, things like food, drink, and rest of them so they can sit down in a more relaxed way? And why don't you do it in patches? Short up, short up, but you can say, oh, today um, about 50 people should come around and um, just put them in a more way. Instead of asking old grandfathers and the rest of grandmothers to come and be in, at the end of it, how much is even the pension? Some of them might not get more than 5,000 naira. Or ten thousand naira money. Is that why you ask them to? Come? So uh, is it is a collapse of the of the system? And once we get a more realistic way of going about this, then it won't be a problem. They don't need to come around, do your verification, confirm if they are alive. They are alive. Then uh, you pay them. I just let them open account, and money will be wired into the account. Those that are the petitioners want, then yes, be able to. But to ask old people, it is not the first time. It happened in the, in the year past. We are those in the military, military pensioners. I remember in Abuja, in those days where I was staying, you see, you see these military pensioners come and line up in front of a um, uh, pension office uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Wuse, uh, Zone 4, Zone 3 area. And some of them will sleep out for weeks. I'm not saying this, weeks. You see them sitting, sleeping outside on their floor just because they came for verification for their pension. That is not good at all. Hmm. Okay, well, we've seen uh, talking about pension and, uh, and monies that need to be paid to some people. They say NPA, which has been scrapped anyway, or we heard the news that has been scrapped. Um, the beneficiaries will get a, a backlog, a pay backlog from next month. That's what the federal government is promising. But um, that may not be as strong as a story where uh, the senator that has been removed, Senator uh, Elijah Abu, has been removed, and he is attributing uh, his ordeal to the fact that he was fighting that uh, the Senate president now, uh, Godfrey Lapabio, should not be the Senate president, and he feels that his travails are because he fought against the presidency of uh, Senator Akwabio, Senate President Akwabio. Akwabio sacked Abu uh, over um, appeal court verdict. Akwabio sacked Abu uh, clash over appeal court verdict. Appeal court has sacked Senator uh, Abu and he's saying it's because of Akwabio. Um, well, I, I don't know how, how much you know about the the internal politics in the National Assembly, and I don't know uh, how you will rate this statement by Senator Abu. Now, Senator Abu is on his own. Um, as we say in local parliament, uh, he's on his own uh, because I, I don't know what um, that has to that, um, has to do with the senior president. Is he saying that the senior president is a, a member of the uh, sort of the, uh, page, uh, uh, tribunal? or the initial tribunal that uh, I was able to give his verdict. Um, he's just looking for straw to, uh, to hold on to. The fact is that he has been sacked. His election has been nullified. And 
it cannot fault the courts um, that were able to do that because they did their diligence. It is based on the evidence before them and based on the evidence before them. So I don't see there was no place I saw a party coming to testify at the tribunal that opposed um, the election of the president of, of the president of the Senate. Now, whether other uh, he was not even a contestant, he didn't contest. So what is he talking about? He now trying to rub in and all that and say, oh, the next person is going to be the audience of color. He's just the man is just. This is a senator that had the opportunity. One of what we say, young, uh, want younger uh, individuals in the Senate. This is one of the people that we are looking for. Senator, I think he's under forty, or even under fifty. If that's where it's not, it's not fifty years. So you expected him as an individual, as someone, uh, an ambassador, be used to be able to uh, represent them effectively in the Senate. But what did you see? Is a man going around buying uh, sex toys, going around slapping a woman. And, uh, and the rest of them, even during the screening of uh, one of the ministers, he had what he said when uh, was, uh, one of them was being asked, how come you, know, you, were, you went to secondary or university at this so the tender day you are talking about? And you don't have a, oh, he said, no, uh, some people are very brilliant, are very brilliant, that they don't even know to go to the work for all of you. All sorts of things. This has been a very controversial place. So if you didn't win the election in Adama, that is what it is. You have been sad. Yeah, let him just go and leave his wounds. And prepare for 2027. Then he sat on the table of the uh, Sydney president, it's just, uh, it's just hanging out to a straw. And that is what it is. And the Sydney president has replied, uh, replied him this morning that he had to sad and uh, he should just make him out of his problems. So that is what it is. I just hope that is not an indictment that uh, Abu knows what they do and how it is possible for someone to influence judgment because if he is confident enough to say that, that means he knows what uh, can be done by particular individuals to influence judgment. But I just, I just hope that, like you said, he's just holding on to straws and all that. But talking about sa uh, sacking, there's a possibility we might be seeing a sack uh, from uh, Ondo State. Uh, the deputy governor has lost the bid to stall impeachment. Uh, so, in fact, in Nigeria, when you talk impeachment, they are not even talking about indictment. They are talking about removal, uh, which is not the same thing anyway. But they are talking impeachment now. It's the wrong terminology, by the way. But this is what we, it is. He was trying to stall that process of impeachment. Now the courts have ruled that he cannot stop it anymore. Uh, but I'm concerned about what has been happening between principals or between governors and the deputy governor. I don't know if the rules spelled out by the constitution for the governor, uh, or for the deputy governors, makes them nothing more than just an aid to the governor. That the governor can just, by a snap of finger, remove you if they want to remove you. It gives me worry. Yes. I don't know how you feel. Yes, it is. Um, I totally agree with you. Some of us have been talking that we have constitutional rules for the deputy governors because, as it the constitution is, is that as of now, uh, deputy governors as it were. So they are just at the uh, at the, the mercy of the governor. instance of governor, mm -hmm. mercy of the governor. So whatever the governor pass on to them, to do, that is what. So you saw what is happening in the two states. Same problem. Where the governor unilaterally just asks his uh, deputy to move away from government as I'm going to hire one of our store office outside within town for the deputy governor and has not been giving him anything so to do. So I think we should need to those those that crafted our constitution should be able to look at that uh, and be able to give specific functions so that everybody knows where it belongs. Yes, the governor is the chief executive of the state. But the fact is, it remains that without a deputy governor, the governor cannot run by election. There is no governor that can run an election. So that means that it's a joint ticket. And most of them are not. What happens one of the tickets also affected that you saw what happened in Bayelsa State, where somebody won an election just because of the fact uh, an election as a governor. But just a day, 24 hours before he was sworn in, how to do that his deputy was not properly nominated. And then um, he had some issues. And because of that, he lost it. So the deputy cannot, the constitutionally cannot do or cannot become a governor without the deputy. But coming to Ondo State, um, what is playing out in Ondo State is a terrible one. It's politics has played. But the fundamental issues I need to ask is that everybody has said, where is Governor Akredo? It has been established that it's not in Ondo State. 
that he says is back in the country. But nobody has seen him in, 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 in those states. So where is the government? We are told that he's in Ibadan. Ibadan is resident in Ibadan. Is Ibadan the, the, uh, uh, the resident where he's supposed to be? Is that where he's supposed to be? And because of that, the opposition came out to his state to try to protest and try to ask where is our government. He owes them. He, he, he owes them the right to know where they are. The citizens of Ibadan they need to know. But what did the police do? The police barricaded them and stopped them from that protest. Every Nigerian has, by the constitution of the constitution, it has been established that police cannot stop anybody from protesting. Nobody, no police, not even the inspector general, they can stop anybody from protesting. It has been established up to the Supreme Court. The only thing you can do is to make sure that that protest is peaceful and by providing a kind of corridor for all the protesters, if they, for any reason, go out of their way and they become violent, then they can be arrested. But that you stand and stop people from going out to protest, that is unconstitutional and that should be that shouldn't be really said at all. So the police, for me, have taken side on this issue and shouldn't be seen. So but the fact remains that whatever the courts say at the end of it, if the court says that the impeachment process should go on, the impeachment process should go on. I know that he has been fighting uh, to Tanil through his uh, counsel uh, to be able to stop to stop that. But don't forget also that this same governor had the same issue with his former deputy governor, um Abola who um, during his first term, first term, and at the end of it, he was unable to rule the deputy governor until, the, until the, that regime uh, lapsed, and um, and that was all the best. I think the most important aspect of it is that the Ondo State people and Nigerians are asking, where is Governor Rotimi Akredo? Since he said he came back from um, for his treatment abroad, nobody has seen him in Ondo State. That can be verified. Hmm. That's serious. That's uh, information that. As uh, so many people may not have known. Okay. Uh, at 1,000 Naira per dollar, which, which is being uh, uh, very generous, 30% uh, inflation, over 90% Nigerians denied healthy diet. That's one of the um, headlines on the Guardian newspaper. That's the Guardian newspaper we're looking at right now. But just following that story, because they have uh, said 1,000 naira per dollar which you even mentioned that it's about 130 uh, 1030 naira per dollar now federal government pegs fx rate at 700 naira per dollar as overhead costs spike 26 trillion naira 2024 budget fx rate pegged by the federal government uh, at 700 naira per dollar I'm not an economist. I'm just trying to understand. When you say it is a free market now and all the restrictions on the dollar has been removed, let the market forces see what it can do. And the federal government is still uh, pegging uh, the FX rate at a particular rate. I, I, help me understand what it means. I'm not also an economist. So, <laughs> is, this, is there still, is this still a free market? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. The fact remains that, yes, um, the, the federal government, and such as I said, it has collapsed uh, these windows into one uh, window, and that is why there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be anything in the parallel market or the official market, uh, official window. So everything is well, one bet. There's a, a window that is, or is it the E, e and F, E and B, I've forgotten the name. I and E for people, And yes, yes, I and E, that's just, and E, for certain individuals, the manufacturers and the rest of them who want to buy um, dollars to be able to for exportation of goods and services that that they should have the opportunity to um, assess that win. and that is why you can see that is it last week or so um, the federal government lifted a ban on uh, 43 items uh, uh, that were uh, uh, that they were banned as importation and they said that uh, individuals trying to uh, Import such goods can go through that uh, that that window. They were not able to assess that window. I think that also implies international price. But the most important thing for me is that whether I, 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 I and the window, whether it is official parallel and rest, the fact is that nobody can assess the dollar in Nigeria now. At least nothing less than one thousand and thirteen, and that is what it is. Then you just go back and just within three, this is just within three months that this government, how much was the dollar on the 29th of May 2023 when this current government came into play or into place? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. 
it was just something around seven seven hundred uh, naira or so. And so and now it is over one thousand. When we said that it's going to hit that is there, oh some people say, Oh, you know that profit or no. But the fact is that if you are not earning more, you are not you are not exporting more, then there's a, you are not earning, then there's a problem with with it. You cannot be able to manage it. And also the IMF and the other so called International uh, World Bank and the rest of them have been encouraging the government to devalue the Naira. The Naira has been devalued of unofficially, and that is the situation. That is why you're having that big problem. But if we're not earning more, if we're not exporting more, if you're not doing as much as we can to be able to earn, uh, if I just remain an import driven country, then it, the pressure on the Naira. And it's affecting manufacturing of the You saw what man said a few weeks ago that they are shutting down. They are laying off staff, and that is a problem for them. So the government, through its economic team, should be able to look at areas where we can be able to mediate this, so that we don't see a naira by December. This is probably going to about one thousand five hundred. Now I'm talking to in those days we used to hear, oh, the Zimbabwe uh, money is yeah. for how much to a dot blah blah. But it's happening in Nigeria. The dream your widest they ever believe that naira can come to um, about one thousand naira to a dollar. Never buy my widest and never ever. Oh, uh, well, uh, it's scary what the future looks like. Uh, we do hope that we, that we will be given the landmarks and the, and the things to look out for uh, so that we will know that uh, the government is achieving what they're intending. But right now, every Nigerian just knows that we are suffering and we do not know how long it will take, what things to look out for, uh, that if we see that they're achieving, uh, we would know that whatever has been promised will come to us. But we don't know. Um, I'd like us, before we wrap up, this is the final question I'm asking you. Uh, Israel-Hamas war, you, you, you talked a little bit about it, but what is happening there, uh, some people are saying this might lead to a third world war. Uh, there's, on the one hand, the Russia-Ukraine war, and then there's, on the other hand, the um, Israel-Hamas war. Uh, the Arab nations seem to be mobilizing. And then uh, America, which is boasting right now to be the strongest nation of all time, uh, is supporting Israel and supporting Ukraine as well. So the world is divided, you know, uh, more or less. And I don't know where you see this leading us. And we as a country, the war is affecting us. How much more do you think it will affect us? Yes, um, you know, if you're a student of like, like Christian like me, uh, we've been told that uh, it's an, an, an ending war that we continue to return it. So don't think that uh, the Israeli... Uh, okay, we lost the audio from uh, Chris uh, Kainden Wandu there. Uh, I do hope that... I do wish that I wish that uh, he could continue and just wrap it up there. But um, we've been talking with Chris uh, Kende Nwandu on the program this morning, and Chris is a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. He's talking to us here uh, in Lagos. We were trying to cover what the headlines were this morning on our national dailies. Today we were only able to take punch the nation. Uh, the Guardian and uh, the Nation newspaper uh, on the program. It was Punch, the Guardian and the Nation, yeah, I was right, uh, on the program this morning. Well, we will take a short break and when we return, we'll be talking or we'll be uh, visiting our first hot topic, as it were. Just don't go anywhere. Stay with us. <laughs>